you're live. Hey, how are you? It's nice to see you. You're my first virtual conference that I'm moderating. And you're probably wondering, who's that? You might be saying, wait a second, I recognize that voice, but what is she doing in my face right now? It's Maria Hinojosa. You know me um, from Latino USA, which you should be subscribing to right now on your phones and in the thick, which you should also be subscribing to. Um, and I run Futuro Media, which is an independent nonprofit media organization. I think I'm the only Latina that runs a newsroom, um, a nonprofit newsroom in the United States. So before we get into the conversation today, um, this is a really challenging time for all of us. You're all feeling it. We're all feeling multiple things. And I think one of the things we want to acknowledge is our feelings. And so that's not usually what we do in a professional setting. But given where we are, and actually I do it on, on my politics podcast all the time, is how are you feeling? Like, what's your temperature check? So, Teresa Younger, you are the president and CEO of the Ms. Foundation. What's your temperature check? And maybe one thing that you're doing, I was going to say COVID coping or just coping, something maybe that's bringing you joy, real quick. Sure, thanks. It's so great to be with all of you and good to see you, Maria. Um, I think uh, my temperature check is... Um, Probably, I would say I'm a little, running a little warm these days. My heart is really heavy as, is, uh, as it is with many folks and I think sleep uh, is missing. But uh, I do think the thing that is uh, bringing me hope in so many levels is in some ways seeing the communities come together and for me a recognition of what is happening uh, in the, with black and brown women and our leadership in this moment in time. It brings me joy to see that and the, and the, and the young people that are doing it. And so uh, I, I, I actually am sitting in a place of hopefulness and gratitude. We need people like you, yes. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Don Chen, you are the president and CEO of the Surna Foundation. Um, what's, what's going on for you? How are you doing and what are you, how are you COVID coping? slash coping in general. Thanks, Maria. It's great to be with you all. Um, I think uh, my temperature is uh, running hot. My heart is racing. Uh, I'm frankly feeling a lot of grief and really pissed off. Um, it is a really difficult time um, in the United States and across the globe. And um, I have a feeling that we have, you know, not only the pandemic, but uh, the um, protests uh, in response to the killing of George Floyd. And uh, it's just layer upon layer of uh, so many challenges that um, can't help but feel outrage uh, at this time. Of course, I am an optimistic person. Uh, I, I always think about what we can do. And so that's what's really giving me hope right now. Um, and I do think that we're in a moment, we're in a really critical moment of transition where um, folks have offered a vision for a better America, for uh, a better world, and it's really the time now to work towards that. So um, I think what helps the most is really connecting with folks, uh, even if it's virtually. This is really a, a soothing and encouraging thing for me to experience. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Um, Nicole Mayer, uh, President and CEO of Group Health Foundation particularly challenging time for a health foundation. How are you doing? How are you COVID coping slash coping? Something that's bringing you joy. Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I am, the, the grinding heaviness of what we're experiencing is very real. And I believe we're just at the beginning of real change in this country. And so, um, you know, as an indigenous woman, one of the things that helps me is to think about time and what a re incredibly young country this is and um, to remember that time is on our side. This morning when I was walking my dog, I live in front of a park in Harlem in New York City, the epicenter, um, and I was looking at turtles with my son and I was like, maybe they've been here for a hundred years already. Imagine everything that they've seen. All right, Tony uh, Mestres, you are the president and CEO of the Seattle Foundation. 
how, what's your temperature check in something that's bringing you joy? Well, I would, Maria, thank you. It's, it's a real honor to be talking to everyone today. I would um, share uh, the sentiment that some of my colleagues have offered around feeling hot, but uh, also trying not to get cold and, uh, and to uh, take advantage of the ethos that, that others have described around this, uh, this opportunity. And um, while I feel outrage and anger, uh, I also feel, I think, this sense of conviction that uh, we have a moment and I feel personal responsibility to step up to that moment with our organization. So with that comes the optimism that I think we all need to have to fuel the work that we do with our communities. So when you work in philanthropy, um, as we all are, are in one way or another tied to, you know, we're used to responding to a certain level of crises. Like that's something to do. As a journalist, right, we, we understand this. But certainly, and we, this conversation through HIP was actually to have a conversation about COVID and, um, and what we do in this moment, especially because COVID has become what I call, you know, the, the POC story. It's C-O-V-I-D, POC, a people of color story. And now we are also centered in a moment where people of color um, are really the central piece of the story on both elements. And yet, you know, as a journalist, I'm really focused to trying to take control of that narrative. So for those of you now, I mean, and I think it's okay for us to also talk about the reality of whiplash because you were just doing the catch up with COVID and now we understand like it can't just be that. So who wants to start us off with the kind of, how are you responding? And I know that I, I'm a survivor of COVID. Um, I'm very public about that. And the first 10 days I was in denial. I mean, I just couldn't, and my head was completely cloudy and I couldn't. So I also understand and it's okay to acknowledge that maybe we just need a minute to catch up because we are so overwhelmed. So who wants to start us off with kind of how you're putting all of this together in terms of the, the urgent work that we all do? I'm gonna start out. <laughs> um, it's such a good question. I am often drawn to the quote of Aubrey Lord. There's no such thing as a single issue fight because we don't lead single issue lives. And so I know at the Ms. Foundation, and this actually happens I think at many institutions, we were approaching any of our work from one stream. And COVID in and of itself um, was just a, uh, you know, I always say, you can call it COVID or you can call it racism, sexism, white supremacy, and everything else, right? Um, and how it is hitting us is really based on um, the fact that we carry so many of these disparities and it is disproportionately affecting us because of that gap and what those disparities look like. Um, so I know what we are doing is um, actually doubling down on what we have done before, which is let's not rely on systems that were not built for us to be the ones that save us at the end of the day. And let's help to deconstruct them and lift up the voices, particularly for us, women and girls of color, to be able to present the solutions and to give room for those solutions not to be perfect of us have had to live in systems that were broken and asked to accept it, what if we proposed a new solution that didn't have that? And so for us, we're trying to make sure that we give room for our emotional and our physical health in this process, we, that we give room for our sisters and our brothers in this process to also find that space and then to understand so much of what Nicole said, which is this is not just about today. This is about a long-term arc of what change is going to look like. And now's the time to start putting those uh, suggestions some of those solutions are going to be to the systemic change. I'm feeling that optimism from you, Teresa. Who, who wants to? We appreciate it. We need it. Um, Don, go ahead. I'm happy to jump in next. Um, I think it's, uh, in, a, in a weird way, um, there's a parallel between our challenges regarding uh, COVID-19 and um, uh, the racism and oppression that we've seen in so many systems in the U.S. and is bubbling over, boiling over right now. Um, if you think about COVID-19, uh, you know, there are efforts all across the entire globe 
uh, among people, among institutions, countries, really trying to work together to solve this problem together because our because we have a clear destiny. Uh, and uh, you know, if we can work together, if we can develop solutions together, then then we may have a path to wellness, to to prosperity, and to um, a good life that uh, has been elusive for many of us. I would say the same thing goes for other global challenges like climate change and uh, the challenges that we face regarding um, racism in the United States. Uh, it is a time uh, for not only you know weak citizens, residents of uh, this country, um, to really work together, uh, to pull together, to, to come up with solutions. Um, uh, but uh, it's also something where we're seeing solidarity coming from. Uh, marches in other countries. There have been marches in Brazil and Poland and Syria and Australia in support of um, justice for George Floyd. Um, so I really see the solidarity piece being critical. Um, I started this month um, thinking about Asian uh, American Pacific Islander Heritage Month here in, in the United States. Last week I started writing a blog post and, and realized that um, uh, the thing that we all need to do is to express solidarity because, you know, those of us who are AAPI experiencing racism uh, because of all the you know, xenophobic and anti-Asian sentiment during COVID, we're feeling that sting. This is a sting that uh, African Americans have felt for centuries. Um, Latinx folks, Hispanics have been feeling it for as long and you know we have families separated and so it's not just one issue we can't take offense on behalf of our own people you know we have to really show solidarity with all folks who are experiencing this type of um, uh, racism and and um, and band together to develop those solutions that'll get us to a better place got you guys so optimism solidarity I'm, no, seriously, I needed this. I, I, I really needed this, especially waking up, you know, to the news today in, in New York City. Um, Nicole, Tony, who wants yeah. to jump in? Go ahead, I'll Nicole. Be, um, so, um, I was a person who talked about time in the beginning, and you will hear me bring up time again, but in this moment, I want to bring impatience and urgency. And so, you know, I think about what's front and center on my mind and I, I actually get a little frustrated when philanthropy is a little too self-congratulatory about how we have switched to general operating grants or made our processes easier or began to trust that communities always knew what to do. Um, we should have always been doing that. We should, that is a proven practice for excellent grant making and so I'm, a, I'm a, like a little bit glad that we've started to do a better job at that, but I'm really careful when I talk about the work of Group Health Foundation to say, um, that's what we have already been doing. We should just be doing more of it um, because it's a best practice. I think the other part is that now more than ever, we should shed our fears around investing in long-term political power building and explicitly resourcing um, the communities who carry the greatest burdens to organize, to build power, to have long-term sustainable infrastructure and capacity. Um, I know it's not any news to anyone in this audience that um, folks who hold an equity ideology, um, folks who I consider to be aligned in, in much of the worldview we bring to the table at Group Health Foundation. Um, we are also the part of philanthropy that tends to invest in services as opposed, as opposed to political infrastructure and civic health. We tend to be very fearful about how to get resources to C4s and organizing and advocacy and campaign work. Whereas folks who, um, really have held on to a, a racist ideology, have very, very little fear about investing in those things and have been incredibly successful in 
bringing forward their worldview and indoctrinating it into um, our, our local and regional governments. And so I just think now is the time to shed those fears and to really challenge ourselves to move away from um, the, the cozy places we have found ourselves in philanthropy and own that power to really center the communities most impacted through giving them money, which is basically the essence of our job. You know, Tony, if it, if it wasn't for all of those think tanks, the conservative think tanks that were being funded by philanthropists who knew, as Nicole is saying, kind of the bigger picture, um, yeah, we, we, we would be at a different spot. I'm also thinking about this morning um, when I checked in with the New York Times, which I do or don't do every day, depending on how I'm feeling. But today, the first headline was, let's hear voices of the protesters. And my jaw dropped. I was like, wow. That is not to say that all the media gets it, but it was a moment where it was like, thank you for centering the protesters and not this other thing, which is a, you know, a whole other situation. So Tony, how are you managing um, the realities of what's being called for you um, as somebody in a foundation of a very important city? in this country in terms of leading progressive thought and, acti and action. Thank you, Maria. Um, yeah, and to build on, on my colleagues' comments and, and some of Nicole's in particular, I think that uh, the crisis, the first you know, public health crisis and then the economic impact as a result of that on our most vulnerable communities has, uh, has allowed us to cement our equity principles and our practices relative to things like centering on race. Uh, things like elevating community voices uh, in a way that because of the urgency of the crisis and how we were, uh, I think, successful in bringing uh, business as well as philanthropy uh, uh, front and center with the community to address this, what was uh, a, a more uncomfortable set of uh, uh, dissonances is now an immutable practice that we must, in fact, do things that work with community-based organizations that are deeply rooted in the most vulnerable communities, recognize the uh, inarguable data associated with the impact of this crisis, both health as well as economic on people of color, uh, to work to support populations like undocumented people uh, so that we are, uh, are really living our principles. And while it's almost impossible to, to paint anything that, that's going on uh, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the bright light through all of this crisis, I do think that that is true. And community foundations are in an interesting position because we advise thousands of philanthropists, um, many of whom uh, are white and, and represent uh, power and privilege. And so we feel an obligation to step up to that moment as an opportunity to bridge the community to that type of prince to those principles to those values in the worst days you know philanthropy organizations doing what we do are philanthropic pets of white power and privilege and in the best days they are actually taking responsibility to lead and to educate and to bridge people who may not have the lived experience may not have the knowledge of what uh, we need to do to support our equity principles and I think some of that bridging is happening right now in a meaningful way. But, uh, you know, last night, I'll just end quickly by saying last night uh, in my neighborhood, there was, there was tear gas stinging people's eyes. Uh, and we had uh, uh, people out for the, you know, the, the third night uh, protesting. And as many of the leaders in our community are making sure that we, uh, we espouse uh, many of those protests are deeply rooted in things that must be vocalized. And uh, I'm proud to, to be partnering with many of the folks who are uh, protesting uh, very validly and with great substantiation of things that need to change right now. So there's the sense of, um, of urgency, but also Nicole talked about patience. And I'm, I'm also somebody who has both things like all of us going on at the same time. I try to be a little bit slower in terms of response and understanding like, um, you know, that there's a complexity behind everything that we're going through, but also this sense of, of, of urgency and not acting enough 
Um, how do you put that together in terms of your philanthropy um, and, and the urgency that you know exists on the ground and whether or not you're feeling like you're able to respond with the equivalent amount of urgency um, and how you're managing that? Go ahead. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll start this time. I think that um, many of us have had to scramble a couple of times very quickly, very recently. So COVID was a major uh, effort to respond to, and now we're in the midst of yet another uh, enormous crisis. And I think the urgency is that we do have to act. Um, uh, we have taken an approach that many other foundations have taken, which is to respond focus on recovery, and then really think about long-term uh, reimagination of what this country can be. Um, and just to, uh, to what Nicole and others have said, um, you know, many of us are optimistic that uh, this is a moment where people really become much more aware of some of the challenges that we have that are really deeply set in our, in our culture and in our institutions. Uh, and it's a time to call for change. And so I think um, the ability to be nimble and to react and respond to what's happening right now. Um, with COVID, it was uh, responding with as much uh, supplemental uh, grant dollars as we could, flexibility, all the things that we should have been doing all along. We especially need now to shore up organizations and to think about long-term strategy uh, and to prioritize that and keep our eyes on, on that opportunity as well. Um, I think in the coming months, even the next several years, um, I'm hoping that we'll see more and more foundations thinking about some of those structural changes that will require a lot of strategic thinking and implementation uh, to achieve the kind of reforms that we've been talking about. So how do we, how do we, as people of color who are within the philanthropic world, how do we add to the narrative so that it's not, we're gonna rebuild, but actually we're gonna recreate, redistribute, revolutionize, whatever the word. How do you do that uh, in this moment? How do you take on that particular challenge of, it's not about rebuilding. And also, I'm not sure who it was. Was it Don or Teresa who had said something and we may not get it right. Um, you know, as somebody who is on the receiving end of philanthropy, you know, there's always that like, oh my God, but what if something goes wrong? What if you know? So there's an element of risk that everybody involved in philanthropy to a certain degree has got to be willing to accept and yet it's also a challenge. Who wants to kind of talk about that in terms of responding to our privilege in this moment? I'm gonna jump in and then I'd love to hear from my colleagues on this. You know, one of the things I think is most telling is that uh, philanthropy, well, we kind of classify ourselves as philanthropy, we're actually talking to multiple different kinds of foundations that are speaking today. And so, you know, the Ms. Foundation is a public foundation. We raise the dollars that we, we move to the field. Um, one of the things that I always keep in mind is that the table wasn't set for me, so I'm going to bring a chair and make sure I'm sitting there. Um, and so one of the things I think we all have to do, and I know given um, my colleagues on this call, the tables were not set for us. And so we have to decide which tables we wanna go in, how we wanna challenge at those tables, how we lead by example, and then what we want, to, we want the outcome to be. And for us, everything is a risk, right? When we don't do it right, it becomes an example of our communities not doing it right. And when we do do it right, there's all of a sudden a huge surprise that it was done, even though we are professionals in our field. Or at least that's how I feel about it. Um, so one of the things that I know I've tried to do is position myself at the tables and then bring other folks to the tables with me so that we can start talking about it from the real position that we want to, which is a, to deconstruct what is going on and to move things forward with a repositioning of what power looks like and who holds the power. And, um, and that is not always a welcome thing people want to hear. How did, how, and how did you know? I was gonna say, aha, uh -huh. mm -hmm. 
Um, one of the questions that, um, that that was just given to me um, through HIP was that, um, you know, this notion, which we all know, right, which is that um, I, I'm so happy that I lead um, an organization that is led by women of color um, and that is majority POC, immigrant um, women. And so I, I feel so blessed um, and that my board is reflective of that. But we also know that in philanthropy, the boards in particular, um, that's not where you're seeing the the representation. There's more corporate um, representation than there is the grassroots. And doesn't that help explain why we got here, where there is this big disconnect? So how do each of you feel like you can use this moment to do something structural to challenge this? Tony, you raise your hand. Go ahead. Well, I think that the... Um before the crisis, uh, the COVID crisis hit, we were constructing a, a vision of shared prosperity where our entire community has uh, opportunity, regardless of geography, identity, um, or, or, or really uh, any other set of circumstances that we know are fueling the inequities that, that are built into the systems we're trying to reconstruct. And I think that shared vision has legs to it. And it has legs to it in terms of, uh, you know, you take the perhaps the most hostile audiences to that shared vision, and increasingly we recognize that empirically we all do better when we all do better. You you then add the values that I think that with a degree of education and experience and relationship, more and more people can adopt and bridge to uh, to a place where they can support that type of shared vision. And now it is so stark, so horrific, so urgent that uh, when we looked at our strategy and what we needed to change as a result of these times, our conclusion was we just need to do it better, faster, and uh, in partnership with community. Uh, and it is, a, it is a window of opportunity that we are committed to not squander. I think that's... Uh... Oops, sorry. I was trying to avoid the kitchen sounds, but there you go. Go, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I, I want to reinforce what uh, uh, Tony and, uh, and Teresa have just said, which is, um, you know, I, I do think that uh, if you look at all of the different possible tools that philanthropy has at its disposal, there are many. Uh, there's convening, there's grant making, there's, you know, public leadership in your community. One of the things that um, grant makers are not very good at uh, which frankly journalists, writers like you, Maria, are much better at and very good at, uh, is uh, really shaping the conversation, really telling a different narrative. Um, and when we think about structural change, um, I think journalists such as yourself, uh, yourself uh, through podcasts and whatnot, books, um, really can help us uh, understand what's going on uh, get people to think differently about what's happening, uh, really understand with accuracy and, and values attached to it, um, a different story than we're normally fed. Um, and that's why it's, it's so important to really pay attention to what's happening on the ground in terms of reporting. Um, and, and that's where philanthropy can really learn a lot from, from your sector. You know, Interestingly, a lot of people don't necessarily make the connection between the framing of the, the narrative and the stories and the role of journalists. But I think if you think about what we're witnessing right now or just over the coverage of COVID, um, as I had said, as I said on the thick, you know, most of the mainstream news, one, it's not diverse, but they don't necessarily do a good job of covering communities of color to begin with. Exactly. Why do we think that right now during COVID that they're suddenly gonna become expert at those communities? And so then my concern is that we become more invisible to the mainstream. The other side of that, the optimistic side, right, is that I have my own company. We do what we want. We set the narrative. We do it. But you, we, I always feel like I'm fighting this bigger, bigger challenge. Nicole, you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm still, my mind is still on a different topic. So if you want to keep with that. No, go. Go back. Go. Go, go. Well, um, my mind is frozen in that earlier conversation we were actually having about risk and how we're thinking about risk in the field. And, you know, um, 
you know, I came to this work as an advocate. I started out as a executive director of what began as a small Native American organization that grew over 12 years in part because of philanthropy. But, you know, our first few years, we received no money from philanthropy. We were um, the ninth largest Native community in the United States. Every bad indicator we could have had, we were the worst. And just mathematically speaking, if you wanted to improve graduation rates, decrease foster care, improve health, there was no better community to invest in, very similar to um, every other community of color. If you want to improve an outcome, it's the best way to go, regardless of how you feel. And yet, philanthropy gave us no money. The only way philanthropy could have given us less money is if they came to our nonprofit, broke in, and stole a computer. Um, and we were given all the reasons. We, you know, were we ready? Did we have capacity? The, the whole, whole list. You've all heard them. It's sort of like the, the little handbook of dog whistle philanthropy racism. And the only reason I share that is um, it's like in that situation, what we decided was that there was zero risk for us to raise hell, organize with other communities of color, and frankly begin to publish reports about all of the ways that money were not going to black communities, were not going to Latino and Latina communities. And so I, I would just say, um, I think we are a field that manifests some fake risks. And when you look at the, the pattern of grant making in our field, about our lack of investing in organizations um, ran by women of color. Um, you know, I see particularly troubling patterns for um, Latino and Latino communities across Washington state where we're primarily focused, where the way that the word equity has been corrupted is that white organizations take up the cause on behalf of community and apply for resources to do charity for and philanthropy co-signs that by investing in white-led organizations to do services to and for communities right. as right. opposed to those communities. And so to me, that corruption of the word equity, that's the greatest risk that we're facing. Our inability to have an iron fist and hold on to those values and to follow through with our actions, like that's the risk I'm talking about. And so I just wish we would break up with this idea that it's reputational risk or political risk and really remember that it's the impact that we're jeopardizing when we, we don't follow through with. The right, that, that, that if you only focus on that kind of risk or even a financial risk, then what's it all about? Tony, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, yeah. just to build on Nicole's uh, comments, you know, the... Um, Angela Glover Blackwell said, uh, said what's, what's reputation worth if you're not prepared to risk it? And uh, I think that for uh, an organization like ours, where the, the, the previous legacy lens was, what can we do to live our values but not upset the philanthropists yeah. uh, is out the window. And um, you know, I've, had to, I've had to have some deep inspection of my uh, management and leadership principles knowing that uh, we will do the things that we're discussing are necessary for us to, to reinvent these systems and address inequities, uh, like 85% of our foundation grant making going to people of color led organizations supporting communities of color. And uh, we will withstand whatever consequences come with that. We intend to do that in a way that also educates and embraces uh, more people to that set of principles, but I can't wring my hands in trying to balance these two constituencies. We, we, we literally have a, a named dissonance within the foundation about this, and we're working to remove what parts of it still exist, but it, 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 will, it will leave a mark. It will hurt all kinds of things. It could decrease our base, decrease our operating budget, et cetera, we are betting that being on the side of standing by our convictions will actually not only pay off our community, but set an example for the rest of philanthropy and make a difference for uh, the people who matter. Uh, sorry. Um, 
Right. And so what you're doing, Tony, is you're basically saying long term, not in a year, but long term, what does this country look like? in all kinds of ways. And what is our role to helping get to that place where we're looking at things from a very different kind of prism. So here's the thing, hold hold on, hold on one second. So we have three minutes and then, you know, the button will go off and we'll just go poof. No, we're going to take questions from uh, the audience, but I did want to give everybody with the three minutes that we have, and you guys all have, so you can watch to just kind of do your closing thoughts before we, um, well, and the question that I wanted to ask you actually is, what's the thing that you're, again, to use your optimism, that you're rethinking in the most positive way? The thing that in this moment has allowed you to rethink one thing in the most positive way. And so we've got now two minutes for everybody. Um, we'll start with you, Don. Um, so real fast. Sure, uh, to rethink, I would say um, really, continuing to do the important work of racial justice as a foundation and to offer our learning journey. We, we the Serdna Foundation, went through a journey to embrace racial justice as our mission a couple of years ago. Um, we want to share that. We want to talk with other folks in the philanthropic field about how we did it um, and, uh, and you know, talk about the challenges and, and the outcomes. Um, so we want to remain committed to that ongoing work. I love that. Nicole. I would just say there are badass leaders from communities of color in every corner of this country. Put them on your board, hire them. Anyone who says they can't find them, obnoxiously interrupt that lie and um, help our country have leadership that matches who we are today. Love it. Tony. I think it's hard to demonize somebody that you know and relationship building and having a whole community narrative, I think is a propellant that um, can help us really execute on all of the things that we're working on right now. And uh, that is, there's no playbook to that that I've seen. uh, So we have to write it together. Great, take us out, Teresa. Yeah, I don't know if it's a rethink or just a reaffirmation of the fact that we really have to um, listen to, trust and believe women of color in the solutions that they put forward for us. And we have to do that in a, in a place of urgency, but then we have to do it by investing in the second and third lines of leadership within all of these organizations and institutions so that we do not burn people out, but we build them up. And I'm not rethinking it, but I say it's really important that we start speaking our truth to the reality of what we are trying to do and the world we are trying to build. Okay, so I have, we, do have, we do have a question from the audience. Um, can I go ahead and do that, Ana Marie? Okay, um, this is, um, if there is no representation from LGBTQ people with disabilities and communities of color within foundations, the money will continue going to white-led organizations um, that have the networks to wealth. Okay, that's a comment. Um, Hold on, let's see. A one portfolio. Okay, I'm not exactly seeing a question here. So, um, Ana Marie? Great. Well, then uh, Mr. Gil Peñalosa is waiting for us in the next room. So let's wrap up this session. It was fantastic. I learned so much. Maria, you are always brilliant. First Zoom, I see a whole long career in front of you (laughs) moderating Zoom calls. (laughs) And to our fabulous panelists, thank you very much for kicking us off in the day. Um, And we will look forward to sharing during the next couple of days. So um, creating a vibrant and healthy cities for all is in the next room. You just leave this one and then start on the next one. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Gracias.